Welcome to Startup to Storefront, presented by Ourobora. All right, welcome to the podcast on today's show with Steven for Uoma Sporta. Uoma Sport. Perfecto. For the English folk. For people who don't know, what does the brand do? Yeah, so the brand, yeah, Uomo means men in Italian. So I was trying to actually kind of hark on the days when, you know, clothing was Italian, was made in Italy, a lot of it in Biella, Italy. So I wanted a, you know, I was trying to figure out, ah, what could the name be? And I wanted something clean with the letters. I just, I was actually in a restaurant in New York, and Uomo means man, so you'll see Uomo or Donna on a bathroom door. So I actually was in a restaurant and saw the name and said, ah, if we put like sport together, like Prada Sport, Uomo Sport, could be interesting. So I kind of just kind of like the way it sounded. I like the way the letters look together. Yeah. So that's how I kind of came up with it. It was almost okay. going to be a French brand. So it was actually I, at Rolling Garros. I like Garros. that you chose Italy for my wife and her family. They're yeah. very Italian. The one thing I've always, I mean, I've, I got into tennis recently, six, seven years ago. Awesome. And I'm addicted. I became addicted very quickly, coaching the whole thing every day, blah, blah, blah. And uh, at some point, it, I really realized there, there's a real fashion gap here with tennis in particular. And it's I think it starts with the sneakers. The sneakers are the most obvious example of we're missing the mark. And then it just continues to everything else. And it's really interesting, right? Where it's almost like you're almost better off wearing something you'd wear to the gym, t-shirt style with some wick fabric. But not, it's not classy. It's not elegant. It's not like golf attire. And there was a, a, like a huge hole. And it's been bothering me for a while. You're, you, you guys came along. And I was like, finally, somebody's doing something about throwback. it classic, timeless brand. I think, you know, getting back to, God, I was in Capri and it was a hotel that had this book, the most interesting, awesome Italian, seeing all the players, the way they carried themselves, the Panetta, the way they all dressed. Mm -hmm. It was unreal. I mean, it was so stylish and so fashionable and so chic and so cool. Yeah. Why, you know, when the great brands, who I have so much admiration for Fila, Tacchini, Aless, they made such high quality stuff that I wasn't thinking tennis at all growing up. And you know, I had a beautiful Aless polo. I had a Dakini tracksuit. And the quality, if I had it today, it would still completely sure. hold up. You know, so I think that when some of those brands put it on players, some of the players succeeded. McEnroe succeeded tremendously, you know, wearing um, Dakini, Borg wearing um, Fila, Pat Cash wearing Aless. And then they just, I guess, ran into some problems because the players became popular. And obviously, you know, way back in the day when Stan Smith's agent made the deal for him with the Adidas Stan Smith, where he got a piece of it. I think that brands weren't able to financially live up to the deals with the players when they started winning Grand Slams and getting prize money. Okay. Um, so I think that's when it actually kind of became Nike, great running gear company, yeah. got into tennis. So a lot of brands have actually kind of rushed into tennis, didn't really think about tennis that much or really kind of understand or study. You know, I, I was at the U.S. Open when I was 12 years old, and I was actually at a tennis academy in Cheshire, Connecticut called New England Tennis Academy, and it was all dressing all white. But the cool thing about it is they gave my brother and I, I don't know how we got clubhouse passes to the U.S. Open, and we were in the clubhouse with... Stan Smith, Nastasi, Ash. And for me, you know, I was really kind of really into basketball growing up and loved, you know, the basketball players and their uniforms and how they looked. And, you know, the, the, again, like Puma Clydes came along or like the Pro Keds, just really very stylish, you know, the way some of these players, um, you know, Adidas superstars, Adidas pro models, yeah. just the shoes and, and just the style, the colors. And I was just really wildly, wildly, wildly into it. So then I saw these athletes in the, you know, in the clubhouse at Forest Hills, the U.S. Open, and they were, they were the coolest athletes. They, they all, the Stasi was wearing this brown with tan stripes. Stan Smith looked very fresh, very all-American. Arthur Ashe had this polo with the placket that was part of the polo. And these guys just had such style, and it just, it stayed with me forever. I just, I never forgot about it. I said, these are the, I said to myself, I said, these are the coolest athletes of any sport. The way these guys, these guys, I don't even know if they even knew how cool they were, sure. but these guys were the personality, the charisma, like they walked into a room. There was and they an iconic the status, yeah. All of them. It wasn't like, today you think about two, three, four guys, maybe you think about a little bit, obviously, and those guys are starting to 
uh, fade away a little bit. Obviously, um, you know what what Rafa has done is unbelievable, and what Federer has done is unbelievable, and you know Andy Murray, what he's done is unbelievable. But you know now it's kind of a younger generation. So where's this younger generation? Where are they going to go with style and fashion? I mean, it's cool that we're seeing now. You know, with like Yannick Sinner, I think is the most amazing, stylish. Yeah. I think he's the next Federer. I think, I think this, so too. I think this guy is the coolest he's got guy. Got the Gucci that, bag coming to center court. Now. I mean, it's crazy. When you first started the company, how did you decide? Obviously, you got Brooksby, but how did you decide to get? Did you realize how important it was that you needed to get an athlete pretty quickly? And and just from a business perspective, to, get, to give listeners like a window into maybe not so much how much money you it was it's really required to take this thing off, right? And so one thing you're doing is you have to commit to a line of clothing. You're obviously moving into women's apparel now. And so to a small entrepreneur, this might seem like a large upfront cost. To an experienced entrepreneur, it might be what's required. And then ultimately also, you have to have the ability to get athletes. You have to, to you win, to. right? You just so, have to, I mean, really what it comes down to is getting people to believe in you, to believe in the confidence, to believe in the style, to see the passion that I have. And I'm, you know, I'm looking from their passion, my passion, you know, I'm looking for that marriage together. And uh, I got very lucky with Jensen. First of all, he was overlooked. You know, this kid was number one in the United States in the 12s, 14s, 16s, 18s. You know, he pretty much won everything. You know, he won Orange Bowl. He was number one college recruit in the country. And he's, you know, he, he grew. And, he, you know, he beat five of the top ten players in his first year on the tour. Yeah. You know, there were some mistakes along the way. They're fixing some things right now. But great, great agent behind him who uh, really believes in him. So we're very much on the same page, his agent and I. His agent believes in the brand. Yeah. His agent realizes that, you know, he could get lost at being at, you know, another one of these brands. He's going to get a lot of attention. He's going to get a lot of care. He's going to be involved. Right. That's interesting. Okay. And, you know, just really behind him. I mean, literally. And you sold that story or did they just understand it? They understood it. He really, they understood it. And he got, you know, for very, you know, we insured him for bonuses and he reached a number of the bonuses. We, you know, we, we paid him some money. I actually brought an investor onto the brand because he really put us on the map when he played Novak Djokovic. He won the first set 6-1. I'll never got, forget that. He played perfect tennis, yeah, perfect got, strategy. I mean, he, he was very tired <laughs> up to that because he had, yeah. had some pretty big wins. Yeah. And um, yeah, he, he was just unbelievable <laughs> on this first set. So in the first hour, one hour, we got actually 162 online orders in one hour. So you saw it in real time. We saw it in real time. Wow. And I, I think, you know... I don't know if it's really legal to say this. Actually, Brad Gilbert gave us a shout out and said, like, you know, that brand or something with California or Malibu, or that kid from NorCal, because Brad's from NorCal. So I think he kind of, yeah, I think Brad wants to see what, what Jensen's going to do now with the injuries yeah. and overcoming the injury, injuries. He said, you know, he's got a very, very, very high IQ. He's working really hard uh, right now, you know, getting over the surgeries. When did you sign him? I signed him when he was basically before he had turned pro. He was about to turn pro, okay. and college actually he never got to play for Baylor. He was um, because he was in a boot. Okay. He had a um, an injury, so you know he was really excited to play for that team. So he you know decides he's going to go pro. I'm going to go play some challenger tournaments, and he just gets unbelievable results. He wins like you know he's in five challengers. I think. I think he won four. I think he was in a final in the other one. And then he went into playing in some other surfaces he's never even played on before and reached, you know, reached the finals and some pretty major tournaments. Yeah. So he just, so he you knows, got him early. Okay. He knows how to, he knows how to fight. He knows how to win and he's going to get in your head. He's a very hard kid to beat. Yeah. You're going to have to go out there and really, you know, really play incredibly That's pretty good well. timing though, in terms of, I remember we were talking to a uh, Dr. Jason Wor Worslander from Therabody. Mm -hmm. And we, when he, we had him on the podcast, he had just signed his first athlete and it was Colin Morikawa, the golfer. And I think he had just graduated college. And then he goes on to win the U.S. Open mm -hmm. almost immediately thereafter. And I think from that success, now he's got F1, Amazing. Uh, you know, Theragun's got, or Therabody has all these athletes all of a sudden. But the first one they spent a lot of due diligence on was Colin. And it was crazy how quickly that worked out. Yeah, um, you know, translating a tennis player into, a, you know, building the success of a brand. You know, I think it's almost like people talk about, you know, awareness, and influencers and all that kind of stuff. You know, a lot of it, you want to be as true to the brand as possible, because if you, ha you know, have an influencer the next day, they're being paid to handle another brand. Right. It's a little tricky. Yeah. So I'd rather, you know, find athletes. And there's a bunch of other things. We're actually going to getting into business with a hockey player. Okay. So who wore one of our polos playing golf. 
and he's a 25-year-old hockey player. I guess I can announce who he, he, we're actually working on it right now. His name's Clayton Keller, and he's uh, signed a very, very, very lucrative contract with the uh, Arizona Coyotes. And he's really into fashion. He's 25. He's an all-star. He's a massive contract. His agents reached out to me one day, and I'm, I don't follow hockey that much, but I'm going to start to follow it more. <laughs> Um, Makes and sense. He's, just, he's, an, he's an awesome guy. And so what does he say? He's like, hey, I got a hockey player, but he plays golf and he likes your stuff? Yeah, and, his, he, yeah, and I guess, well, you know, how do we translate that? So, <laughs> so yeah, so the agents said, the agents were amazing. Like, let's get this in the arena. Yeah. So we're going to get it into the arena. Let's get it into his club called Silverleaf. Okay. And then we're going to start marketing him with it. I actually want to put him with some of the tennis players. I'm hoping he'll come to Indian Wells for a shoot. You know, put him like get him out there playing golf with Thomas Burdich yeah. or you know Pat Cash or a couple of these other you know guys who you know were four in the world or Pat won Wimbledon you know Thomas Burdich is a you know legend and a great looking guy and one of the coolest guys out there turning into you know a great coach yeah. so I'm glad that some of these guys you know are it's giving back you know so awesome. yeah I, you know financially it's a tough business you know it's a tough business you know when you you can get on people's minds obviously there's some amazing things that I can't even believe it that are even happening what I'm really hoping for at the end of the day here and I had a conversation yesterday with Ryan McCauley I'm hoping there's a tournament in Los Angeles a real tournament in Los Angeles it's a shame you can't believe the people that live here yeah. and people like I'm talking about even if they don't live here Bill Ackman sure. Bill Gates some passionate guys who get up every day and play tennis like let's have a tournament here. Let's keep tennis healthy, alive. Let's yeah. bring American tennis, you know, let's turn it on its on its head and make it what it should be, what it was. Sure. And it's like you walk into the Labor Cup, I was just there, you know, got to meet Roger and talk to him for a little bit. Amazing what he's done. But why can't we have something here in the US yeah. when you walk into a curated event with Rod Laver and all the history and the Labor Cup and what they've done, but the, the history of you know, Jimmy Connors and John McEnroe. Like, you walk into a curated room with, with, you know, you go into John's Academy in New York and you see all this, but Jimmy Connors, he has a podcast as well as you know, or his, his, um, with his son. Um, but, you know, there's just Arthur Ashe, there's Billie Jean King. There's such legendary icons behind this sport. But why don't we have a tournament here? Why, you know, obviously Indian Wells, amazing what, what Larry Ellison's done there. But there's so many powerful... And so there's an opportunity. You're saying, Bill, and these people look at it like an opportunity of how do we get this thing to connect here locally? How do we locally? get these guys together to believe in, yeah. all right, you know, New York, Los Angeles, obviously Indian Wells, there's a few other tournaments in some other states, but this is Los Angeles. I mean, this is, you know, this is the capital of Hollywood. And is there an appetite when you talk to them? or I want to get a group of guys together. Yeah. And in my lifetime, I want to see this happen. You know, I want to hopefully, you know, there's a legacy you know, it's like Pete Sampras. I mean, he's here. If he could just show up. Yeah. <laughs> and if you just, you know, at, at, at U.S. Open last year when you had Bradley Cooper there and you had Brad Pitt there right. and you had Leonardo DiCaprio there and, you know, Brad was at Wimbledon, they're getting into it. They're into it. They love watching the sports, one of the greatest sports to watch. Yeah. And I think, I believe that getting back, back on the clothing, you know, I, I, what I see today, unfortunately, is like you see tennis players, they look like they're going to play on center court in a grand slam. It looks like they're going out to a practice court in a park. It's kind of strange. And the you, calico colors this year of uh, certain big brand were very strange to me. I mean, it's... And the sleevelessness They're trying also. to make... They're just trying to get noticed, these brands, and tennis is a small blip on the map of right. so many of these... Respective to their other, other verticals. You know, other yeah, their sports. other sports. It's, you know, it's a huge sport internationally. It's huge. And I think that, you know, the racket technology, what's going on right now with tennis, more people are playing tennis now. Obviously, pickleball is another, that's a whole other conversation. But I think that tennis is growing in a, in a major way. And people love watching it and see these celebrities coming out, people supporting the sport, seeing other athletes, you know, seeing Formula One guys, seeing hockey players, seeing... Obviously, you know, Labor Cup, you know, the Dirk and um, Steve Nash. Steve, Steve, Nash, Steve Nash, Nash is really yeah. into tennis. He's into really tennis. Really into it. Apparently, he's really good, too. I mean, he's, yeah, he's, he's gotten pretty he's good pretty quick. Yeah. I mean, obviously, the sadness of Kobe, who was just kind of getting into tennis. And you know, I, I think it's the athleticism of tennis. I mean, today, you know, the power of the, the, I mean, the rackets, the technology, the strings, the spins, the, 
I mean, it's 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 unbelievable. I mean, if you you know you're seeing a you know the racket, you know a forehand or backhand, the speed, the 120, 30, 40 miles an hour right. serve, you can barely see the ball. Right. It's a tough sport. When you think about pickleball or even padel, does it give you an opportunity, or do you see an opportunity in that from a branding perspective? I, I do. It... I'd be you know to overlook pickleball would be really dumb. So I'm trying to get involved now in. I actually went to the pickleball draw in Las Vegas. I was trying to kind of you know learn about it. What I'm hoping with pickleball is that obviously it's played in all these incredible clubs all over the country, that players actually want to show up and look good in pickleball clothing. It's such a social sport, and there's a lot of, I was just at a pickleball cancer charity benefit. For me, on a tennis court, you know, and obviously tennis, you've got to be very quiet when you're hearing for the players, the respect to the players. You know, if it's a let, you want to, you know, you just want to sure. really hear the ball, hear it off their racket. There's an etiquette that exists. There's an etiquette. Yeah. I think with pickleball, I'm not sure. It's such a social thing. <laughs> right. There's no etiquette. And I, I, I could never, uh, I actually tried playing it uh, one or two times, but playing it around a lot of people when it's very loud, it's, I, you got to, I mean, it's any sport. It's like, yeah. you know, the professional ping pong players, it's pretty quiet in there. I don't know what the what the etiquette really is of of pickleball yet. How that's actually gonna? I don't think it translates that great on television. Yes, that's I think true. It's fun to yeah. watch. Yeah, I think it's fun to play. A lot of people I know in the television world that they'll basically say like, I don't need to watch myself or a version of myself play pickleball. Right. It's not that cool. The guy doesn't look that inspiring. There's a cool guy, <laughs> Matt Manasse. I don't know if you've interviewed him. I mean, he's pickleball to the stars. He really kind of put. Hollywood and pickleball on the map here and he really got a lot of people very 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 interested and I think he's going to be commentating on tennis channel pickleball and obviously a lot of great athletes are getting involved with pickleball with the teams right. you know it, it is exciting you know I guess there's there's two leagues that are joining each other now it is exciting I'm actually kind of interested in I actually when I started the brand I had a meeting with Andre Leconte former French tennis player and he was talking about padel 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 and I kind of overlooked Padel. Yeah. But Padel is a very cool sport. It's apparently overtook tennis as the most popular racket sport in Spain. It's a very, 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 very athletic, interesting, cool sport that I think it's going to take off in the United States. Obviously, pickleball. I think so, too. Yeah. Huge. We just had this conversation. But when you think about this in a, in a real way, so we have obviously the, the, the birth and a massive growth of pickleball. Old sport, but it's taken off since the pandemic. And then I think about what's happened globally. And so Padel is winning that battle easily when it comes Global. to racket sports like Padel and then tennis and pickleball is kind of a distant cousin. Right. I wouldn't even say it's a race, but in America, pickleball has won. And so when you think about this long term, do you think, let's say you're a board member at LATC and you have to decide the future. <laughs> do you do pickleball and Padel? Or okay, do you I, think, I think I'm actually talking to a neighbor of mine uh, who has a very, very, very cool space turning it into a padel. I really believe that playing tennis next to a pickleball court is really annoying. The sound of it when you're playing tennis is really tough. I really believe that there should be separate pickleball facilities. I don't think a tennis club like LA Tennis Club should be bringing in pickleball. It's a pure, incredible, iconic tennis club. That's a tennis club. Sure. So I think obviously real estate, they all want to play. It's it's an easier on the body sport. Yeah. I'm just not a fan of taking some of these clubs, reducing the tennis courts, totally, yeah. and turning them into pickleball. I, I'd like to see some incredible facilities. There's a company called Reserve. It's building some stuff in, you know, in New York with Padel yes. and and pickle, and it's a very very cutting edge yeah. group of guys. Good branding. Good branding. Yeah. So I I think that I think it should live in its own space. Yeah. In my opinion. When I think about your brand, it feels more Padel to me, oddly enough. I mean, it feels higher quality, I, higher I like, end. I'd it's really, really like nice. to push it in that direction. I'm really yeah. interested. I'm really kind of learning about it. I'm hoping to do this all-star Padel uh, event that's coming up. Like, a, like a all-stars or just like celebrity plus all-star? No, I think it's like the best Padel players compete against each other. I, I don't think it's a celebrity thing. Yeah. It's actually going to happen in San Diego, run by Ryan Redondo and Jim Courier's company called Inside Out Sports. They do a lot of the events. I've, I've been aligned with them on a number of events. I've been very fortunate. I, th this brand exists only because of, because of one thing. It exists because of truly my friends who have gotten behind the brand, started wearing the brand, you know, built out of a very grassroots 
group of people that have been super loyal to me. Um, there's a guy here, Toby Crable, who's so passionate. I think he's, an, he's the number one tennis player in the United States, 65 and under uh, and over. I think he's a little under that. I think he could actually compete at you know with the 50-year-old players. Yeah. He's amazing, and he has basically an academy, and he brings in, like I had uh, Nicholas Almagro wearing some stuff. He brought Almagro in, trained with him. He has a guy, Brian DeBall, who works with him and his son and a bunch of kids, and, and he really is very serious because tennis is great for life. It's great for you know, your mind and thinking and staying fit. There's just so many things that it, it, it helps you. You, know, you meet some of the best. I, all, I tell all the kids that are growing up, Get your kids into tennis because, first of all, they're going to meet very smart kids. They're going to meet kids that they're going to be friends with the rest of their life. So yeah. tennis is uh, the culture of guys. I mean, I, I play, I have a 100 guys, part of our Team Womo group of guys that we play live ball. You know, um, obviously, I've done it actually at LATC. We've taken two courts. We had 16, 20 guys, two coaches, and then we go, all go to dinner after. But, yeah, every Saturday we play, you know, when I'm usually around or there's a just – Amazing, amazing group of coaches that are all incredible. That's smart. When it comes to the brand, what's been the most challenging part? So you got Brooks, but you mentioned you got some sales coming. You probably got some sales after, maybe like for that week, maybe for a couple of months after. But Yeah, it's been, it's been uh, I think, you know, getting it out there. We dress the Pepperdine team, you know, seeing the kids wear it all around Malibu. Is, it's, it's very cool and great, great coaches, great group of kids. Is it just a lot of marketing or is it like word of mouth? It's What's a lot of marketing. It's constantly creating content. It's staying on people's minds, you know, not ever relying on one thing, always having the next thing, the next thing, the next thing, the next thing eventually for it to catch on. I think doing some of the um, digital marketing stuff is is hard. You know, I think that it doesn't always necessarily translate into mm. dollars. And do you have a team? We want, I have a team. We want, to, we want to create a great brand. At the end of the day, sure. we don't have the means of, you know, any of these massive brands. But I think the brand is growing, and it's growing tremendously, and it's becoming, it's becoming very successful in a lot of ways for a lot of reasons. Like we're very lucky with Tennis Warehouse. Now we're actually going into, I'm actually doing a press conference in Mexico. I'm going to get involved with uh, Tennis Depot, who is going to take the brand under their wing and really get behind the brand and start building the brand in Mexico. They have great stores. They have, they're building the online model like Tennis Warehouse. Tennis Warehouse is a, they've helped the brand. They actually did some very interesting marketing behind the brand. It's, isn't that funny to think about where it's like, you go to places like London or Mexico and you'll see a tennis store every every street. Yeah, <laughs> but you, th- you, th- you even think about that in America. It's a bygone dead thing. You, you don't see. I mean, you, you go find into it. Westwood Sporting Goods. You know, they string wrap. You got to go see Brad in Malibu to get some gear. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, it's it's, <laughs> it's strange. I mean, that 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 that, that classic tennis shop. I think it could exist. I actually, uh, you know, there was a, there was an amazing store in Beverly Hills that had all these Cassini, all these incredible brands. It was ski and tennis. It was super chic. I mean, they had the best. Ski clothes, the best tennis clothes. This was more of a 70s thing. I actually think that could come back, but I wouldn't take a risk. Uh, what I would do is I think that, this, you know, like skiing is somewhat seasonal. Tennis is somewhat seasonable. Um, we want to create some style lounges. We want to create some very cool things around tournaments. Um, and I think to do some pop-ups, do a pop-up in the Hamptons, do a pop-up on Madison Avenue, during the week of the U.S. Open, invite some amazing people there, talk about strength and conditioning, talk about nutrition, you know, have people that don't want to be, you know, in Flushing Meadows the whole day. They're there in New York for the week or two weeks to see some tennis. You know, it could be an amazing environment to create something where they can come in and, you know, have a you know, very healthy juice bar and just, you know, have tennis on all the time. So back to that brand building piece, yeah. So these are, these are things sense. that are, there's just, there's a lot, there's so much opportunity. There's so many ways to create something that people just aren't, I think the standard way of building a brand doesn't really work. You know, you have to kind of keep it in a very organic way where you just have to kind of go with the flow of things. You know, I mean, I was very lucky in Indian Wells, Jack McFarlane, God bless him. He got behind the brand, gave me one rack. You know, who is this guy? Why does he want to be here? Um, I was very, maybe a little bit aggressive about it because I wanted to kind of get this brand out there. Now he walks around, you know, um, he comes around. This company now, Legends, has done an amazing job with all the apparel at uh, Indian Wells. It's just first rate. I, I think they're going to build some permanent buildings at Indian Wells instead of having the, you know, the, the tents, the tennis warehouse tent and the Legends tent, you know, the rackets and the strings and the shoes in, in three different tents. 
I think it could be an amazing shopping experience. I would agree with that. Very yeah, boutique. that makes sense. Have the Rolex store there. I mean, really make it elegant. Yeah. I think we fit into that, all of that very well. Yeah. And it so, matches yeah. the food. I mean, the food obviously there is great too. Yeah, so, yeah, we have. I mean, obviously, I hope Wolfgang Puck goes back. Please, Wolfgang, go back and, you know, be on center court. Wolfgang Puck, yeah. Spago, you know, the Nobu, amazing to have Nobu there and have its great chefs there. It's a pretty first-rate tournament. It's pretty amazing. The players love it. Yeah. Actually, they're going to have the college teams there a couple of days before they compete against each other. So I'll be there with, you know, Pepperdine guys. But I'll be there, I'm there the whole two weeks in the retail store. So, yeah, they gave us one rack, and then they gave us our own, you know, some major areas, and now we have the women's brand, so we really want to, we do very well in Indian Wells, and I think we're going to do even better this year. We, we make special things for Indian Wells. I, I hope that um, Jensen is back, and I hope that Donna Vekic, I actually met Donna Vekic at Indian Wells. I said, we can't call the brand well and well because you're a woman. It means man. So we have to come up with Donna. People think it's Donna's own brand. But that's okay. She's very behind the brand. She's done great things for the brand as well. And when did the women's brand launch? Yeah, this women's brand is actually kind of, I really feel it's like kind of evolving right now. It's starting to kind of yeah. get out there a little bit. You know, we have to make the first pieces and kind of test it. Like even like the men's pieces, it takes a while to get the pieces exactly, you know, the, the, the short and all the details, the fit, you know, perfect. I think we've really kind of gotten there with the men's polos, the Henleys, the crews, the shorts. And yeah, this the is the one I wear a, a lot. I have, yeah, it's a cool, I have two it's of those. A cool one. I actually got one for my uh, father-in-law. We oh, were in wow. a tournament together, and so we oh, thank you. we showed up matching. I love it. I love <laughs> it. I love when it happens. This is great. I love it. And that. he loved thank it. You. He's a Italian, last name Capolini, and oh, so very cool. That espresso fits into his brand Amazing. perfectly. I love yeah, it. yeah, yeah. So the women's brand is, you know, we I, I, there were a lot of kind of thinking about the men's brand, how to create the women's brand. So when I was kind of when I was growing up. Just remember, all these fashionable women wore, they wore this, this brand, Alaya. Beautiful, beautiful brand. And I kind of thought about, how do we make something like an Alaya dress sporty? Like, you know, the fit of it. Very kind of the way it fits women's bodies. Um, so how do we turn that into a sports dress? Because I'm kind of, you see so many women wearing leggings, 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 leggings. And they look great in a sporty dress. You know, the way it's tailored to their body, to their back, to their arms, to their legs. And I, I'm really hoping that this dress that we made, four or five colors of it, that it'll become something that becomes a piece that women who can look and feel sporty are wearing all the time. I'm really hoping. So I'm working on all those pieces. You know, you've got the, the crop, you know, you've got the sleeveless top. And you know, i got to figure out what the, what the, um, the demo is. You know, you're selling it to clubs, or you're selling it to... Young athletes, are you selling, selling it to women in their 20s, women in their 30s? So trying to navigate that and trying to right now kind of test the waters and see where it really belongs. I really would like the women's brand to be a very youthful brand. I actually want the, the women's brand to be more 20s, younger. Yeah. And so I want women to feel great and look great and feel confident and feel stylish. Yeah. So I think it's starting to, there were a few women even at this thing at Mulholland Tennis Club, this event, there were a few women, that, including my wife, wearing it. And like, wow, that's really, really chic. That's really beautiful. Yeah. So I think, you know, I just want to kind of carefully... It's interesting, it too, where it's like the, your materials are definitely better, but it's this one thing that you don't really... It's, it's weird to think about that, where it's like people don't expect it. Yeah. You know, and so if, you're, if you throw some care into your materials, all of a sudden people go, oh, that's a lot better than I thought it would have been, right? It's like the floor is so low. The floor is very... <laughs> and the floor that's, is that's honestly... That's the problem. The stuff is so poorly made out there that they throw it out there and they market the heck out of it. The most important thing is the product. The product's got to be great. I know even, you know, the, the people behind our brand, they really believe in the product. They know the product is there. So I think it really kind of comes down to how we get ourselves out there, being smart, marketing ourselves in an interesting way. You know, it's just very important to people that are wearing it, the key people wearing it, that they look great. We have a a young player from uh, Denmark we did a shoot with yesterday. His name's August Holmgren. I think he was number one or two college player in the country. And he's a strapping 6'3", great-looking guy. If he can make it, he can really be, you know, he's like, wow, that could be one of the coolest guys out there. If he was on the tour and he was top 20 in the world, I think there's a lot of potential there with him. I, I just want someone to walk on a tennis court and just to be have presence and have that charisma and have that cool thing that, you know, even what Andy Murray has that Novak 
looks great, carries himself, looks very smart, isn't trying to be a 18-year-old or 17-year-old, look that part. Roger always knew how to look that part. So I think the players don't really know how to look that part. I want to help them work with them to make them feel and look that part because you're competing against another player who's wearing the same outfit. Right. He's also 6'4". You can't really determine who's who. Yeah. I don't think it helps the sport. I don't really think it's a great thing for a brand to have so many guys wearing the same clothing, exactly. Like if I'm Nick Kyrgios, who I adore, he's an unbelievable athlete, super, super cool guy, and really passionate about the sport. I would work with Nick so closely to create his style. Yeah. Some of these players that walk out on a tennis court, I just don't think they know. They, you know they I would just, agree with they, that. They just, they don't, They're they not thinking don't about know. It. They, yeah. they, they could look so much better. This stuff should fit them right. If you come back a year from now, where do you think the brand is? How many athletes do you think you have? What does that look like to you? Listen, there's a lot of competition in this space. But, you know, when the Vilbercan bathing suit brand, when Orlebar Brown came along, he did a great job. So I think there's so much. I think our brand can be the prominent, premium, elite brand in the sport. I think it should be the, I think it should be the highest quality brand. I think it should be the Laura Piano, Brunella Cuccinelli yeah. of tennis. Yeah. I'd like to see the brand collaborate with a couple of these other brands because a couple of these other brands, like Thomas Burdich, who was paid a lot of money to wear H&M, and they rushed into it. Or Under Armour, they rushed into it. You know, like designing the, the short took five years to get this short. I made the clothing with our production, our design people, uh, the details, our fabrics, our trims, at every component, every piece, the tape rubbing against your neck on your body, that if you're wearing inferior fabric, that irritates your skin, that you get rashes and you perspire and you get, you spend more time in the dermatologist by wearing, you should not be wearing fabrics that someone will say, hey, it's dry fit, it's climate cool. It's really not. It's like they're really buying inexpensive fabrics. They're not spending the money on the fabrics. We spent a fortune on the fabrics because it's going on to an athlete. They're the ones out there. They're the ones that are suffering out there when it's hot, and humid, and you know they're tired, and the clothing should not fail them. The clothing should be as good as the technology of the rackets and the strings, and it's not. Yeah. So that's there's a reason for us. We exist. We exist for that. You know, we want to put the best fabrics, the best fit, um, the highest quality Italian microfiber that we bring in from Italy to go into the pocket of the short. So when you put your hand in the short, it helps dry, you know, some of the sweat off your off your hands. Wow. It's a recycled drawstring cord. A lot of places embroider. So we, we do what Montclair does. We do an embroidered patch. And each patch has to be different to go with each piece. There's so much detail. There's so much time that's spent into the quality. When we are selling a short for $120, we should be selling this short for $200. We should be. But we won't do that to the market. We want people to appreciate it. We want people to wear it. We want it to make it quality, luxury. But we want to make it affordable. And are now your margins still healthy despite that or healthy you enough? You know what? It's, it's tough. The business right now, I was actually on the phone with a friend of mine who's been involved with um, a number of successful brands. It's changing a lot. I think that the, the margins are, are, are tough, yeah. you know, with, with wholesale. It's very, very tough. I think that um, I don't look at wholesale being in, in clubs. I, I think we can be, we're in, a, we're in some of the best clubs in, in, in the United States and hopefully we'll be in some of the best ones in the world. I think that it's a marketing thing, being in a great club for us, being at the Vintage Club or being at you know, Fisher Island. It's more of a marketing thing for us than it is, obviously, to exist. Sure. You've got to exist. You've got to build, bring people to your online store. That's the way a business will exist today. I think having stores and rent, paying high rents in stores. I tell people in clubs when they're purchasing things that if something doesn't work or something's not selling, let's change it out for something else. We want to work with the athletes. We want to work with the retailers. We want to work with Tennis Depot. We want to work with Tennis Warehouse. We want to see what's working. We want to help them find the best pieces in our line that are working for them, that excite them. And the players as well, you know, we want to fit them properly. We really want them to be involved in the style. Like Jensen wants a, he wants us to do kind of a very retro purple color tracksuit. There is a way, 
you know, there's a way to do something that fits his look and still has that retro vintage feel. So he loves this stuff. He just loves it. Like he's so blown away by it. And yeah, I think Donna has been an amazing ambassador. She's got great style. She's elegant. She's beautiful. She's everywhere. She's at Formula One. She's super entrepreneurial. So yeah, I want to work with people that are really driven and are really passionate. Yeah. And that's what I kind of look for. Even when I, even when I go into a you know, into a, a tennis club, a golf club. I want to work with the people that are the buyers that are that they love what they're doing. They want great product in they're their passionate. places. Well, look, I, I want to thank you for one creating a great brand. I think it's amazing. I am a believer of it. Uh, it's good to see someone trying to thank tackle you. the problem in the sport world, despite how tough it might be. And so, kudos to you for going on this adventure. Obviously, wish you nothing but the best. Obviously, we we're big supporters. We'll continue to be supporters. And anything we can do. Let everyone know where they can buy the product, where they can go. You almost sport.com. Yeah, almost sport.com on the website. There's also a lot of, you know, clubs and stores and resorts um, that carry it as well. But we'll take, you know, we'll take great care of you. If something doesn't work right, you know, we will exchange it. We'll make sure you're happy. We'll refund you. We just want you to experience the product. You'll find a lot of times we'll, you know, try our sock. So we'll throw in a sock. It's try a great our sock. wristbands, try our hats. <laughs> All these things, you know, we, we just, we think about, you know, the wristband, we think about the sock, it's got to be right. You know, you, you don't want to wear the wrong sock. You don't want to wear the wrong short. You don't want to wear the wrong polo. All these things matter, and they should matter, because it's it's going on you. It's, it's going, going on, on your body. body. Yeah. You decide yeah. what you're going to wear this morning, what you're going to wear this afternoon, what you're going to wear this evening. You decide. And I think we've made some, some high-quality pieces. If, you know, you want to find quality, you know, come, come see us. Love it. Thank you. Thank you. It was awesome. Thank you for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, share with your friends, your family, or anyone you might think might benefit from the conversation we've had today. And if you haven't already, please take a moment to leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. We'd greatly appreciate it. Your feedback helps us improve and reach more people who can benefit from our discussions. The best way to stay connected with us and get the latest updates on future episodes is through our social media channels. You can find us at Startup Storefront. We'll be back next Tuesday with another great episode. See you then.